Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Fake it till I make it. Poke Google with the stick until the day I die. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you till I make it. That's good. I like it. <sighs> oh, I like it because I, that was my I was trying to learn SEO, and I, you know, in order to get clients, you had to have some kind of established um, uh, history. And ended up being fake it till I make it because most of my stuff was all uh, affiliate, etc. So hmm. history. It's got a bad feedback loop. That's you. You're playing. Me? Yeah. Go to the uh, YouTube. You have where you see the chat and mouse that video. Yeah. Right. Rolling you through. All right. I got you muted for now. It's probably your mic or the video thing. All righty. SEO this week. Hey, everyone. Welcome. My name is Clint Butler. You're on episode 113 of SEO this week. Today, I am joined by uh, our regular Ted Kubaitis. Say hi, Ted. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? I am doing wonderful. Well, I had a bad day yesterday, and I'll tell you about that later. But yeah, it was, it was like the worst day ever yesterday. I'm having a terrible time with uh, getting new uh, test websites indexed on Google. Like, I don't know how everybody else is doing, but it's been a disaster for me. So I can't wait for this Google rollout to finish and for things to normalize. I think it might be close because Kyle was mentioning that he saw the same issues with indexing right before mobile first kicked in. And yeah. today I started actually seeing more issues inside a search console. Like they were worse than normal. Um, but on the bright side, I get an error message and then get frustrated and leave and then come back a couple minutes later and my URLs were indexed. So something's getting fixed in the back. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. Kyle uh, gave me the same message, which is hopeful. And he uh, was trying to be encouraging and told me that, you know, three months later, everything was back to normal. And I'm like, three months? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's hopefully he's Kyle's right, though. Well, I hope not on the three months thing. I'm, I'm hoping like maybe two weeks. That would be nice. Yeah, that would be really nice. <laughs> this other crazy guy looking guy we got with us. His name is Mike Carson. Hey, Mike, say hi. I'm going to unmute you just so you can talk. Actually, I think you have to unmute you. You muted yourself. That's all right. Anyway, Mike's on to share. He's got some audio issues and what he's going to fix up, but. Uh, where he's going to talk some about a post he did where he's comparing a couple uh, CMSs. That was pretty cool. And then he's got some more data just to kind of show and throw your way. Uh, maybe if you want to test this stuff out yourself, see the results that he did, um, or you just want to peer review them and, and see how that works out. Uh, for the stories, probably like seven, I think it is, seven of them, not uh, a whole lot of high-quality content. Uh, this week, a lot of people, you know, guessing on the algorithms, etc. But there's one algorithm update or analysis post that I thought was pretty interesting uh, from Eric Lentry. So we're gonna go over that. Um, I'm gonna try to get Eric on so that we can actually have a nice solid debate though over his stuff because there there are some issues in the way that the data is presented. Uh, you know, I don't want to bash on the guy because uh, he certainly did something that I wasn't going to do, <laughs> which is put together this long list post. But I just want to know more from my education as to how he approached coming up with that data and choosing only to present what he did um, when he appeared to have access to so much. So I think that'll be uh, really helpful for everybody. Uh, and you get to know Eric. He's, he's not half bad at it. So I think I like talking to him. Yeah, I, I like that post. Like, it, you know, I, I didn't make the connection between his data and his conclusions, so it, it'd be cool to hear him out on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I always give massive points to people who, who share their research, and that's clearly what he did, and so that's mad respect for doing that. Yeah, for sure. There's not the people out there that do it and just kind of put themselves out there in that way, and so I think it was, uh, it was a good effort. And uh, it, it brings up a, uh, a 
you know, an ancillary topic of how do you filter out the noise with all of the, you know, online chatter about SEO, all the blog posts and, you know, some of which is like total crap. How can you short circuit the crap? Like my personal technique is I always like to jump to the conclusions and work my way backwards. <laughs> yes, then, then I can say, well, that didn't support the conclusion. That didn't work. <laughs> short circuit it. But, you know, there are strategies. So do, do you have any tips for how to short circuit the noise? I think it comes a lot with experience. Like this week, I went through almost 300 articles this week. It's more than normal. Uh, just because I was looking for for real stuff, you know what I mean? And people aren't writing it. So you get you find yourself a mastermind, one a bunch of people that are actually going to help you and educate you and grow upon you, i.e. you, me, and Kyle. Uh, you know, we have our own thing on the side, and we – we're growing each other as well as educating at the same time. So find that kind of a mastermind for yourself. And then two, start being a lot more selective in the, in the sources, you know, understanding where that news and that information is coming from and how they're developing it. Like one of our sites that we hit all the time, was it the uh, search engine journal? I think, no, it's the other one. Uh, what's the heck of the name of that one? The, the Jewish guy who, who does the, the, the news search engine watch. You know, his stuff is coming out of forums and Twitter, and he's making conclusions based off of that kind of stuff. And that's a little iffy, uh, in my opinion. So once you learn and understand the basics and once you get into a group or a mastermind where you are starting to grow and develop more in your specific uh, marketing path, like I chose SEO, some people choose PPC, other people choose social media or a video. Um, but once you get in that core group and you understand uh, what is and is not BS and how to kind of filter based off of the sources of where they're coming to their conclusions, it makes you a lot easier to pick out, you know, seven posts out of 300, for example. So um, it's, it's something that just takes time, time and experience. There's no way to rush that. So uh, and there's no way to put that into a course and say this is how you do it. Unfortunately, if there was, I'd probably sell one by now. <laughs> or put a seal this week out of business, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, let's see. All right, switch it over. Here's the post. Just so you guys know, admin wise, uh, I'm doing two things. One, I had to pull all the audio off of YouTube all over again from episode 100 on, and I'm going to have to reformat it to get it into uh, iTunes and Spotify. Um, I've already told you guys that I was going to do that a long time ago. I went through the process and then stuff got all messed up. So I got to do it all over again. The good news is, is it's already in and approved in iTunes and it's already in and approved in Spotify. Uh, now I just got to fix the technical stuff. The technical stuff is really just the feed that pushes out. I upload everything in the SoundCloud and then it pushes out to everyone else. So. Um, I just got to be adjusted a little bit. And Spotify is having problems with SoundCloud, which is my biggest hurdle. Uh, also, we're turn I'm turning this into a uh, publication on uh, in Apple and probably in Google Play, uh, kind of a magazine. I'm not sure about the Google Play thing. I want to just do Apple first, see how it plays out, and if it, if it's worthwhile and uh, people get some benefit out of it. Uh, they won't do that. But really, that one's pretty cool. It's, uh, it's been really no more than just publishing people's content in a magazine format uh, that you can read, you know, offline versus having to listen to me or just kind of come up with your own conclusions and you got something to read on the train or the plane or wherever you're at. So um, the benefit of doing that is, one, everyone's writing content, and two, I really just got to edit it and put it together and put it in the magazine format. Uh, and three, if you are writing good stuff, and you want it highlighted and you think it's worthwhile, then uh, go to SEO This Week. Uh, on Digital Air, you'll see SEO This Week up here. Uh, click on that. It'll bring you down here. Fill out this form and just, you know, all I need is the, the URL. It's good or not, uh, I'll know right off the bat. If, if you throw it in the URL, and I'll be able to see that. Uh, and I can highlight it both in the show and the podcast and in the magazine once that launches. So, 
Um, pretty exciting. A lot of things changing around here, and um, I'm looking forward to it. And again, we're doing this for free. Uh, we've never once asked you for a dime. We don't promote products in here. We tell you about good stuff, uh, but everything that we've told you about thus far, uh, if you've noticed, I've not given you an affiliate link because you know it's, it's just stuff that works. Um, if you want my affiliate links, fine. But other than that, just get the stuff and be successful versus you know suffering into uh, uh, into mediocrity, as it were. And with all that said, let's get started with the uh, with stories. Oh, Ted, did you have any comments on the podcast thing in the magazine? I think it's a really cool idea. So if it works, I like to leverage that for Fight Club as well. Yeah, I think that sounds <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think if anything, we can actually, because I know I can embed videos inside of those magazines, um, just the way that works. So having Fight Club in there uh, as part of, you know, that just kind of makes sense. So here's all the news and here's SEO Fight Club and all the great things Ted and Kyle say. Yeah, that's, that sounds fantastic. I can't complain. Yeah, the hard part is just getting that, figuring out the tech stuff. So I've had the access to that thing forever. I've had a... Uh, and just the, the tech stuff is kicking my ass, but that's what it is. Anyway, the first story is from Blogger Spice is how to get uh, how to use Reddit to get more traffic. Um, this is actually really concise. I've covered a couple of Reddit traffic stories before, and I know some people that are successful at pulling traffic from there. Uh, this guy is not one of them. For whatever reason, people just hate me. Uh, I think really it's because I create and uh, develop SEO-related content, and that community just doesn't like self-promotion. Um, so I gotta figure out another way to do it, and I think this post might help. Um, if you are in a, in the market or you're doing some Reddit stuff for clients and you want to generate some more traffic, like over at Over the Top SEO, we have our own Reddit guy. This is all he does. He lives, eats, and breathes Reddit for our clients. Uh, and this is certainly a good process to follow up. Maybe I'll get our Reddit guy up on a show too and kind of talk about that. We'll see how that works out. But I think you'll enjoy this post, especially if you're targeting Reddit. But the crust of it is is kind of use a roundabout way to get people to your site, i.e., through images, etc. Uh, and that kind of helps market it off and pop it off a little bit more. It goes into some basics about what a subreddit is, etc. If you don't know, uh, and then the steps to actually get through uh, the process and get some traffic. I again, I like this one just because. Uh, there is a really good active community over there, and once you get a nice solid base, you can get a lot of traffic. You know, we've done it with just some viral images, and just crazy how much traffic Reddit will push to you uh, in a short period of time. It's not long term, I don't, from my experience, but uh, it's a good burst if you're looking for that. Yeah, it's it's a marketing channel. You know, it's it's a social marketing channel. But I'd say you know the vast majority of businesses out there. Uh, are unaware of it or just simply neglect it. And so it, it can be quite the opportunity. I think the biggest problem Reddit probably has is when you compare it to the other networks, it's not as, um, it looks older. It looks like an older older website and people are, are thinking that no one's involved with it. You know, and that can be anything further from the truth. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a post slash dot uh, era you know, social site, you know, news and, and, and sharing, but you know, the people that use it are diehard users. So yeah, yeah if you could tap into it, you know, it, it can have quite the consistency of performance. Oh, for sure. Um, so yeah, here's an open call out. If you know about Reddit and you know how to get traffic off of that bad boy, uh, hit me up. I'd like to have you on. Uh, it'll be pretty cool. Uh, let's see. The next one is how to disable WordPress plugins uh, from loading completely off your site. So I don't know if you guys ever tried uh, Contact Form 7, but whether you have a form there or not, it loads up onto every page of the website. Uh, and there's a lot of plugins that create that situation. Like Mike, he just pointed out one to me where I had my, uh, my social plugin freaked out today, so I got to figure that out. But uh, what it was doing is putting an error message in a place that I didn't even want social uh, attached to. So for whatever reason, you know, we got to figure that out. But all, it loads on every single page of my website, whether social is there or not. Uh, and Contact Form 7, and I'm sure there's plenty of other um, examples of that. Uh, and this post actually goes through the techniques, technical side of disabling those plugins on pages and posts. 
uh, as you go. There is some, oh, there, there's a lot of technical stuff uh, that goes along with that. And you have to keep in mind that a lot of theme designers build their themes around some of these plugins. And what happens is if you disable them, it breaks your theme and, and breaks the presentation. So you have to kind of take that into account. Uh, but he does go through uh, how to actually get the plugins that are that are actively loading stuff and et cetera. My, you know, I would read this and then give it to your dev and see, hey, is this something that we can do? Uh, and if you don't have a dev, just find one that's really smart that can kind of walk you through this and see if it's worthwhile. Uh, really, this is a page speed optimization play. So if your site is just not cutting it, uh, and you think that page speed op optimization is is where it is? This is probably where the last step that you would go beyond caching and CDNs, et cetera. Is just go this far and start thinking with the code. So um, again, we don't really do this at all. So, <laughs> but uh, you can go through and play with this and figure out if it's worthwhile uh, for you. Again, that's a page speed play in my opinion, but uh, it's a really good one, especially if you're on the technical side. Ted, do you ever have you tried to do that? You mess with I know you're not doing client stuff, but turning turning those, you know, or Mike turning those subscripts off so that they're not loading on every page like that. Yeah, I, I mean, it was critical to minimize the amount of uh, asynchronous uh, files being loaded by every page, as well as trying to avoid the heavy ones from executing. You know, one of the big culprits in online retail are the little chat widgets that show up on every page that let you talk to customer service in real time. Those things can often add, you know, one, two, even three or more megabytes of total page weight to each page view. And so what we would do in online retail is we would let people know that there's an option to chat with an image that appears on the page but none of that stuff would actually render and execute until they click the image. And so even, you know, things like that can make a huge difference on total page weight. Yeah. I started in something similar with maps, maps and YouTube, and you're right, the chat functions too, that adds a whole bunch of crap. Uh, and I just, instead of having the map embedded, I would have an image and then it would open in a new tab and go to the map location. Yeah. Well, it's especially hard because you've you've got third party libraries that are feeding in from external resources that you're dealing with as well that you don't have much control over. Yeah. Well, and uh, you know your marketing teams and your executive teams they just keep pasting into Google Tag Manager like it's a an unlimited resource, and you know somebody needs to be a gatekeeper and and draw the line saying no, no, you can. You can add in the, the latest new thing, but you should take away the stuff you're not using anymore. <laughs> and, you know, just cleaning up your tag manager can have a huge impact on performance. Yeah. The tag manager for me, like I know how to do it. I was certified. I went through the Google training, uh, but it's on that technical level where it's so much that I don't leverage it very often. So it's good because I don't have to worry about filling up tag manager. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if, if you look at the waterfall in your uh, web page speed test diagram, if you see that your asynchronous requests are, you know, in the hundreds, you might want to pare down some of that, you know, combine CSS scripts into one web request, uh, you know, things of that nature. Because most browsers, they'll typically by default, they'll load, you know, five things at a time. And if your web page is trying to pull 400 different things, then it's going to stair step five at a time. So eliminating those asynchronous calls can be a huge performance gain, especially uh, when you start talking about the guy standing at the uh, bus stop with his mobile phone on a 4G connection. All those asynchronous requests are a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, next one is uh, Ahrefs plans to announce a new search engine. This one kind of, they, they they mentioned it in a speech, and it kind of went viral, uh, and everyone was talking about it. And um, in my opinion is that they certainly have the resources to pull it off. But the downside is that they're going to need a really extensive budget to uh, break into the human animal of habit and getting actually people to use it. Can, can I swear? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> on Ahrefs, you have my support. Uh, what we need is a player other than Google who actually gives a shit about the end result. And, you know, uh, Google won because of the technical evangelists who went to their moms and dads and their grandmas and grandpas and said, hey, guys, I really think you need to use this. It's something different. It's something special. And it potentially helps my career. If, if we get all the evangelists to swing over to something new, then there's a new player in town. Uh, the problem is, is, you know, Bing doesn't really cater to the evangelists. They're not catering to the webmasters. They're not catering to the people whose life depends on this. They're not catering to the small business. And if Ahrefs does that properly, there can be a swing. And you don't need the majority. You really don't. If you can get close enough to 50%, evangelism will carry you over. So, you know, yeah, I, I love it. I love it. You know, I think Bing doesn't get the attention that it deserves from Microsoft. It's kind of like an afterthought. You know, we have Windows, we have Office, we have Xbox, and oh yeah, we got Bing too. Uh, and that's kind of how they're approaching that. And I think that they would get more market share if they had approached that differently. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think if uh, they added transparency and they added the ability for people that are, you know, designing and deploying and managing websites to get a fair representation or at least a channel to a fair representation, uh, there it would get swingy in a hurry. Yeah. So, and they're close. They are so close that just a little bit of of you know reaching out to the people who actually influence the masses, you know, it, it would help a lot. And Google clearly doesn't give a crap. You can see it in their customer service. Well, and then you know, Google is as Google spreads out more too. That's you know, they're, you know, in the new projects and cloud, et cetera, et cetera, that I think search is just going to be, it's going to, eventually it's going to be an afterthought to them as well. So when you get into the U S uh, Congress and their big speeches about breaking up these companies like Google, um, you know, that's to me, that seems like it would be a good idea for, for search from an SEO perspective. Uh, and it might even work out for Google because now they essentially diversify their income and they can kill off and build new programs faster as needed. Yeah, my, my number one piece of advice for Ahrefs and their search engine is to utter, utterly reject Google's culture of penalties. Just from day one, say that whole climate of people narking on people and the least penalized wins just utterly reject that whole culture. Yeah. And if they do that, then people are going to swing over in a hurry because that will be cool. Yeah. It will be a breath of fresh air that everybody wants. Well, normal people will, but the, you know, the white hat morals riding on their white horses, they'll, they'll stay over with Google. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, there there were those people in the Alta Vista days. They're like, I'm not switching. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Google's till I die. <laughs> and ninety percent of our visitors say Alta what? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. SEO basics is translation duplicate content issue for Google. So I've always been a that really duplicate content there isn't really a penalty for it um, however if your site is less authoritative than another site and they put your stuff up that other site's gonna rank you with your own stuff um, but for the most part a lot, not a lot of people talk about translation and does that apply um, so it, it, for me I would say no it doesn't and there's actually a cool way to use translations to build links uh, Ted do you Let's go with Mike because I we let Ted talk a lot. <laughs> Mike, what do you think? Does it, can you like if I take your site and translate it into Spanish? Is Google going to say hey, that's duplicate content? Uh, and what do you think would be the steps to actually prevent that? Well, number one, I think we need to test that. And number two, I think I think Google is going to. I mean, it's smart enough to know that you know there's there's enough consistency from one language translation that 
it knows which is the original content and maybe I've, I've never tested this, but um, maybe it'd be interesting to know if Google somehow canonicals it. Yeah, or to the English version. That'd be interesting. Yeah, or whichever whichever was the original content. Well, I know you can canonical, let's say you have the English version, the Spanish version, you can canonical each version over to that specific version. Yeah, but do they do it automatically? That's the question. Oh, well, I learned a lot of stuff from Jimmy Kelly, and what he's teaching and I mean, kind of applying is uh, you're, it, they're not seeing those two as the same thing. So uh, because the Spanish is canonical to the Spanish version and the English is canonical to the English and the H ref or H lang stuff is put in place, they're two unique pieces of content. My 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 true thoughts on this are that because machine translation, when you when you machine translate English into another language and then you have it actually translated properly by a native speaker of that other language they come out completely different yeah. so i think it makes it a lot more unique so i think google has no choice and all search engines have no choice but to see them as two unique pieces of content simply because the amount of differences there would naturally be correct yeah what do you think about the con the thought that if you take this page and you translate it in google translate now google has that version but if you translate it and say Microsoft translate. It's a new version that Google's not seen before. Pretty good. <laughs> well, I've never <laughs> thought of that. <laughs> the, uh, the research I've seen, which uh, the, the only research I've seen on this uh, came from Lee Witcher and uh, that research is amazing. I hope he publishes it soon. Okay. Um, but it, it got me thinking that, you know, I want to be putting, you know, Spanish translations and the tool tips on my web page. So yeah. here's an English web page, put a, uh, a UX notification on the page saying, hey, hover, hover content for Spanish, and then use the uh, title attributes on everything to put in Spanish translations, because the research he showed was like, holy cow, the uh, the different language LSI appeared to, to really matter. And so there, there may be exploits, there may be opportunities. This is a whole arena that's, you know, under tested and under studied. I think so. So the link building tip that I was going to give you is if you have a Spanish translation of your site uh, and you did it on no matter what tool you did, and you translate it and you rank it in Mexico, for instance, go to the search results, top 10 search results, and do the same for their competition. Uh, rip the HTML and use that content in your link building tools. Put it in like an S3 site or whatever and just throw up copies of that and link directly to your page. Uh, and it's almost an instant win um, right off the bat. So you just created some content. It's all unique and it's relevant to your website. And you just did it for free. And it took you maybe 10, 15 minutes, depending on what you're using for translation. So. Um, but with that said, that's uh, the topic here is uh, duplicate content. And I'd like you guys to get involved in that. Love him or hate him, Neil Patel is talking about doing this stuff like two years ago because he was seeing a lot of traffic from Portugal. Uh, come in, so he translated his site to that language and got traffic and adjusted for it. So uh, this is something that you know everyone's talking about today, uh, but it's you know a non-growing thing that I think is pretty interesting. So check it out. Uh, let's see. Uh, next one, the link tax. This is a uh, pretty interesting. Uh, the EU passed a law basically saying that Google, Facebook, etc. They were kind of they're. One, there's two versions of this. Is the link tax here is if you if Ted posts an article and Google uses it in the rich snippets, for example, then Google has to pay Ted money, uh, and that's the the link tax method. Uh, and it's kind of they wanted to apply it to a lot more people than just Google, so that could be an issue for the SEO community to see how that goes out and how they choose to enforce it. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I think they mentioned Spain had something like that, and Google said, "Well, f you," and they just shut down Google in Spain, so uh, or Google News. Uh, yeah. 
So yeah. <laughs> it's it's as cap for content. So uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, in the states, if you have a restaurant and you play lots of top forty in your restaurant to your patrons you might have to pay royalties on using that music in your venue. And that sucks for a small business. It does, it genuinely sucks for a small business. Uh, but the idea is that it's to protect the creators of the content from being exploited, so the musicians. And so what's happening is Google is exploiting the creators of web content by taking their information and providing it as answers in search and not compensating. So people will visit Google to get the answers of that content without ever uh, visiting the creators of that content. And while you can opt out of it, you know, there's nothing wrong with Google paying for the usage of that content. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, you know, to me, I would say it's either you have it or you're allowed to, to do it or you're not allowed to do it. So that was probably, that would probably be more reasonable to ask. Uh, for Google, because really what they're going to do is what they did in Spain is just shut off that feature. Uh, so why not just say, hey, if you're going like if you're going to use takecabitis.com to fill out a rich snippet to ans answer, you know, what is SEO? Uh, the attribution under U.S. laws is the link. So there, there's a source, and here's what we're citing it. Now you're now they're they're good. That's how they're they're applying that. Yeah, but uh, Google, keep in mind, Google's making money. They're putting ads all around that all content. Around content. Yep, so there's so, where that kind of, you know. Asking asking for a share is not an unreasonable ask. Yeah, and I think, honestly, as a business owner, that Google would rather just shut that down uh, than use it. Yeah, that's fine, you know, but uh, keep in mind that Google's also, you know, lowering the number of page one organic results from 10 to 9, increasing the ratio of ads on the page. They're putting ads at the bottom, you know, we used to see uh, a click-through rate bump at the bottom of a results page, and now they're putting ads there to take that away too. So, uh, you know, they keep leveraging away any sort of value from the organic web rankings. So, you know, it they've got to give something back. And that's, you know, another reason why I'm hoping that Ahrefs is successful in their search venture. Yeah. You know, it's if if they genuinely care about the website's ranking, they would behave differently. Right. True, true. I don't know. Has it be I'd like to see what happens over there and see if it would, you know, work over here. It'd be interesting if it did. Um, I honestly, I just see them every company. They got two years to implement this in 28 countries, uh, unless they change something. So we'll see how much Google shuts off, i.e., Google News, like they did in Spain. Well, we've seen we've seen Google for a while transitioning with more and more types of rich snippets over the past few years that they're trying to keep more content on their actual search results page without you having to leave that, you know, simply because they add revenue, they, they don't want you leaving their tool, you know, where they're making money. They want to keep you there as much as possible. So I think uh, some of this could help control some of that. I think so. And I think what AMP does is the way that fundamentally works, it keeps you essentially on Google. Uh, like Ted noted, noted uh, and you did, is the rich snippets keep you on Google. Google News keeps you on Google. Uh, and all of those are based off of things that other people are creating that Google's using. So um, it's certainly. And it's, and it's not. Back as publishers? Is it really going to help us out by forcing Google to? to pay? Well, it's not just content. Like if you have a mobile phone, uh, go and search Google for bubble level, B-U-B-B-L-E level, L-E-V-E-L. You search for that. They're also taking the concept of popular mobile apps and putting them directly in the search results. And if you have a compatible phone, you will see a bubble level app appear is a widget in search so you won't even you won't even get the opportunity to get your app to rank they can steal you know high traffic app ideas and put them directly in search results too 
So the potential for this to really run amok and to steal innovative ideas from their creators to keep people in search, it's a real hazard. Well, you've seen that for years with, you know, measurement conversions and, you know, uh, currency conversions, you know, U.S. dollars to to peso, you know, and you never have to leave Google to find that that out. So it's convenient, but it hurts the people that are actually making those tools. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I, I think there needs to be a line. And right now, there there is no line. Google can just sit back and go, yeah, you had a good idea there. We'll just steal it and put it in search. <laughs> so, <laughs> so long to, to your business, it's gone. And then we'll patent it so you have nothing you can do about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So the next one is content strategy after the March twenty, uh, the March twenty nineteen algorithm update. Uh, there's really I wanted to show this one because there's more testing opportunities in here that I thought were interesting. Uh, sites that change domains. Uh, he's they said that the algorithm uh, penalized them because they had. Uh, I don't know if you remember Gary Al said if you have a site and it can be broken up into other sites, then you probably uh, are kind of spread too thin. You should break it up. Uh, people did that, and then they complained after the March 29th algorithm update that they lost traffic. Uh, to me, it's they created brand new websites uh, with no link profile and et cetera. And uh, Kyle tested domain authority, and it's not transferred the way everyone thinks it does. Uh, so even if they use subdomains, it's still a brand new domain uh, off the off the ball, and it's uh, it was hurting them. Uh, so that's one to test out. Another one is long form lists. I know that you know you look at Quora and you look at some of the pools from there. Long form lists are actually correlating very well, and I and it's one of the things that I do uh, as soon as I see it in Quora. I don't even question it anymore. I start doing long form lists, and those are going up. Uh, and he's saying that they're going down, so that uh, you might have to clean that up. Uh, lower quality content, and this is kind of a duh for me, um, and not really all that helpful. And then sites with the active publishing schedule. This one's really cool to test, and that's basically saying uh, if you if you publish once a week, always publish once a week. And as soon as you uh, tell Google that you're not doing it regularly, they're going to stop coming back, and then you're not going to get ranked anymore. Uh, so that's a that's a that's a really good one to test. I don't know how to test how I would go about testing that other than just doing it in live real world kind of situation and see what happens. Um, but you're probably to pull that off. You're going to have to have a couple different sites. Um, actually, you're going to you are going to have to have some different sites. So uh, again, this is really I'm sharing this so that you have some testing ideas. Uh, if you re read the, their conclusions and then they read their comments, they're really contradictory. So uh, don't take anything out of this as a, as a truth. Um, go and check it out for yourself. Uh, which carries us right over into where we started off. Eric Lantry's post in 2019, uh, the core update, the full analysis. He says of a uh, million seven pages, um, and then there's some issues with the post that uh, I think should be made. However, this is actually really good. If you wanted to create a testing post, I think you set a really good standard here. Uh, you know, SIA has their format. And it almost runs along, uh, along with this. I think SIA is better, but, you know, I'm biased. Uh, but this is a really good if you're creating, doing tests and you want to check that stuff out. Uh, the, the main thing that I would say is if you're going to uh, – reference this much data when you make your conclusions you should actually reference that data as well uh, don't make base conclusions off of i.e what you did here was traffic estimates out of ahrefs and sem rush uh, traffic estimates if you have access to that many pages for example and that many that many websites uh, you shouldn't be uh, in this case it was 58 google analytics accounts was certainly enough to formulate some opinions uh, but he didn't cite any of uh, those. So this is the downside of this um, thing. Uh, but what I will say is that he has been chasing algorithm updates since Panda. Uh, his first course was Panda Breakthrough. Um, and it was actually really good. It's where I learned Panda stuff uh, was from his first course. So it's not, don't take this as a, as a bash on this content. It's just kind of how to look at it. 
Um, and I, I think this is really good. Some of the conclusions, like the the word buckets and neuralistic networks, I'm not really you know too sure about. There'll probably be a Ted and Kyle thing. Maybe uh, when we get Eric available, we'll get Ted and Kyle in here and kind of debate that kind of stuff because those guys are into that more than I am. Uh, but he does talk about reversals, and, uh, et cetera, and then some full cover recoveries. But, again, he's making the estimate based off of this. So it's a full traffic recovery. Uh, but if you know how these tools work, the more you rank, the more they estimate your traffic. It doesn't necessarily mean you are getting that traffic. So uh, that's, to me, as an outlier uh, in the testing world, that is, you know, a big red flag to me. Um, Ted, did you see any other things? Uh, I know this is a panda thing where he's talking about over optimization. This probably is category pages. Uh, in this case, probably. You know. um, if you scroll to the bottom, there was that uh, summary of uh, the factors that moved the most. Oh, uh, yeah. That's <coughs> where you started reading. I busted you out. I was like, Ted Speed reading. He's like, oh, no, no, no. no. I went to conclusion first. I like, yeah, oh. I just <laughs> read in a different order. <coughs> uh, as you can see, it's a long post. Big takeaway is takeaway one. Uh, above that, he had a, a little chart of the factors that moved the most. Recovery procedures website. Did he change it? He might have changed it. Well, that sucks because it had the outlier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there oh, there it yeah. is. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, if you zoom in your browser a little bit so that it's a bit more readable. Um, yeah, the, the problem I have is the uh, pages uh, with .gov links went up disproportionately, so it makes me wonder about the sample bias that might be in his keywords used. So if he was in government-related niche, then yeah, that would make sense, but when you look at like 3,000 keywords in a broad spectrum, uh, that's a very disproportionate signal right there. And so because of that, I have serious concerns uh, about the, the scope of the keywords used and why that signal in, in particular shot up so dramatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think really from your perspective, I get what you're saying and from mine is like, I just kind of want to see the data pool. Um, yeah, to specifically why, but for me, it was like, well, if you have 58 Google Analytics, why are we looking at SEM rush for you? What would have made this uh, uh, study just off the hook awesome is if he said, uh, my study covers 3,000 keywords and click here to see the list. Oh, yeah. Like that, that would have made all the difference in the world to me. Because then you, know, you can duplicate it. So yeah, I, I could go and test. Yeah, come with the same up, come up with the same conclusions. Or I could see, oh, I could see why that factor shot up. All of these are related to, you know, insurance regulation. You know. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, as you saw, there's a, it's a big list. He used uh, tools. He even used Cora's tool. Kind of gave you guys a shout out. Uh, SEM Rush Majestic. Uh, again, there's some things in here he says he used but didn't really highlight. Uh, so I think it would be best just to kind of know how his methodology of creating this post. Uh, but it is a really good example of how to create long-form content that's actually useful to people. Yeah, uh, and, and a huge shout-out for just publishing the research to begin with. So few people, like, do that and are willing to open up their data. And it really exposes you because people can nitpick your data when you do that. So it's a real thorn in your side to publish. So I give them huge credit for publishing this research. Yeah. Just huge credit. I'm surprised that some haters haven't sent you know, <laughs> Google over there to complain about it and reverse engineer his site and report it. I'm sure that's happened. So, um, Yeah, but I think he did a good job. Uh, let's see. All right. This is where Mike comes in. This is his post. He shared this with me. <laughs> so... Let's let's do introductions now, Mike. Just tell us a little bit about who you are and why we should be listening to you, and then we'll get on into this thing. I know you have some slides too. Maybe you kind of just break down as I I do. Um, I can go over them, but I mean it's no different than what's 
literally on your screen. Okay, I'll just scan but, uh, scroll down and if you want. You yeah, and there's a, there's a video embedded in that post that actually includes all the all the slides that I I went through and made a little video kind of condensing down this really long post. <laughs> but uh basically I just I own a digital uh, marketing agency. We do web design and SEO and have since 2004. And I've been involved very heavily in the Joomla community for for many years, pretty much ever since then. And we follow, I pretty much followed the fork when Joomla was Mambo and it forked into Joomla. So I've been dealing with Joomla since then. And shortly after here and there, kind of not as much getting into WordPress, but uh, getting as the years went on, I got more heavily into WordPress and we do, you know, a really good split of WordPress and Joomla uh, site development, SEO services and programming um, extension development and plugin development. So what spawned this is I saw over the past couple of years, I've seen a ton of uh, WordPress versus Joomla and um, blog posts. And some of them, you know, were on SEO and some of them were just, you know, talking about core features. Some of them, most of them actually just talk about plugins and they're all over the place. And one recently got posted and I read it and I was like, oh my God, this is such crap. You could totally see that they, they outsource the, uh, the writing to, to some third party and they really didn't know or understand each system very well at all or the ecosystem. So I thought, you know what, why not, why are we guessing at this stuff? Why don't we just test it, you know, and see what it is out of the box. So I, I contacted a, a fellow SEO, I won't call his name out, but his initials were Kyle Roof. And uh, so Kyle and I chatted a little bit on Skype and I said, how, you know, this is what I'm, I'm you know, about to do. And I just want to make sure I'm setting it up properly so that we, we don't have too many variables. You know, we kind of like eliminate the noise, right? So we talked a little bit more about it. And as we went on, Kyle said, you know, I think you should put these two CMSs up against four HTML control sites just to make sure that, that there's nothing weird happening. Well, so we short story, we did that. And because we did that, we found all kinds of weird things happening. <laughs> and what you can see on the screen now is we set up six different websites, four being the HTML control sites, and they were all identical. And the only thing that I did for those is I set up a uh, bootstrap bare template so that th it was responsive and just had, you know, roughly the same overhead as what a WordPress and a Joomla core site would have with their templates. So one of the problems that I immediately found that I didn't foresee or think about was uh, the WordPress and Joomla templates both have real words in their footers and links. So I had to go in and remove that from the code just to, so that's one edit that I had to do just to make sure everything was fair. And all of these sites had the identical content. Uh, the keyword was mentioned three times on each, each of the home pages, and they were just single page websites. Well, bottom line is what we found in the first round of testing is site C, even though it was a third one submitted, Google kept wanting to canonical it to the Joomla site and we couldn't figure out why. And I finally got that out and it never made it into the index. So we finally removed that. And basically what we did is uh, we found that for some reason, the WordPress site always tanked to the bottom. And I, I never saw it move anywhere from, from entry. It was always there. 
in both tests and Joomla was always just, a, you know, one above it. And I completely expected the HTML sites to be on top, which they were. But then a week later, I found that Google basically took all four of the HTML sites and canonicaled all four of them to the Joomla site. Now, I'm not sure how much of this post you guys have read, but I'd love to know your feedback um, and ask you guys some input on why you may think that even though all of the HTML sites were submitted through Search Console first, I did them all in alphabetical order. So site A through C or A, B, C, and D were all the HTML sites. And once they were indexed, then I did the WordPress site and then I did the Joomla site. So why do you think that Joomla would have canonicaled an HTML site to a Joomla site instead of canonicaling, say, three of the HTML sites to one of the HTML sites that has the identical code base and seeing that as more the originating author? Well, uh, the, the first thing is that uh, with, with this kind of testing, you can find evidence to support an idea but kind of everything else is inconclusive. Right. So uh, you have to, to bear in mind that if, if you get an unusual result, then you can't say that, you know, something is, is not a factor. You can just say it was inconclusive for it. Um, the other thing I notice is that you're getting the translate this page. And so that can be a complicating factor. It's one of the reasons I try to shy away from uh, using the Latin. I know that uh, Kyle, when he did his uh, experiments, he doesn't get to translate this page, but he's often using WordPress. And there's a number of features like the uh, uh, Lang attributes uh, forcing it to uh, be English to avoid that. Um, so, you know, I wonder if there might be a complicating factor in there. And then the other thing uh, that we've noticed in, in recent experimentation is that Google sometimes does this weird A-B testing where they just force an unusual result amongst the other test cases. And so it's hard to filter that out unless you repeat the test multiple times. Um, and then uh, another suggestion that, that Kyle often has is if you get a result, if, uh, if having something shoots you to the top, then reconfigure the test so that every page has it and then go to number one and take it away and see if it shoots to the bottom. Can you do the inverse behavior test? Well, we did. I did try to do that by... Re removing site C's content that never showed up in the index at all and automatically got the canonical to site F, which was the Joomla site. So I removed all the content, replaced it with new Ipsum content so that it was completely different, okay? And then I also added the keyword in the body of the content. So it was actually in there four times. And I was my my hope was Google would remove the canonical and then force it to you know it would force it to the top of the results but that still never happened and nothing ever ever changed so my my fear in the first test was that because of these canonicals all pointing to Joom or to the Joomla site that is the reason that Joomla was showing up above the WordPress site and I basically considered it completely inconclusive because there's no way to prove otherwise, right? Yeah. So I had no choice but to rerun the test without the HTML sites. So I reran it identically using completely new domains, new keywords, and the re the end results were, you know, um, if you if you look at test two right here on this page, site A, which is the WordPress site was submitted 
you know, a decent amount of minutes before site B was. So it showed up in the index first. So in my mind, that should have been seen as the originating website of this duplicate content. And then site, site B, the Joomla site, was submitted afterwards, and I've got the times there to show everything. And as soon as that Joomla site was indexed, the WordPress site was omitted from the results immediately. And I found that very, very interesting. Well, another potential complicating factor is having duplicate uh, titles and duplicate meta descriptions. I had no meta descriptions on either of the any of the tests, any of the sites. Yeah, but when you when you look at the search results in in your screenshot, oh, you mean the there, Google produced ones? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Google uh, openly admits that if the salt, uh, search results look too similar, they may filter one, right, or more. And so you you want to try and figure out a way to make sure that that what you're seeing in those search results is different. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be exact match from result to result because you can get weird filtering outcomes with that. Um, another thing that, that I personally have found is that when you also test with your uh, shared keyword in the title tag and uh, is a leading match in the meta description and in an H1 tag, when you share that keyword in those zones, uh, you get unusual outcomes too, especially if what you're testing is a potentially weak signal. And so I'd, I'd be interested to see this test retested without the keyword in those zones. Um, you know, those those are just some ideas on on where to look. So when you get that inconclusive, the next step is how how could you do the test different to maybe rule out some of the complicating facts. So you're saying maybe maybe rerun the test with only the keyword as the site title. Uh, well, without the keyword in the title, you know, because uh, well, what, are you talking as the site title or the the content title? What's what's actually appearing in the title tag? And so if your keywords in the title tag and your keywords in the URL and your keywords in an H1, even though you may be fairly sharing those factors, those are some of the strongest on-page factors we can measure. So it's kind of like saying, well, I'm tr testing uh, the weight of a feather, but on each of the scales, I'm gonna fairly share this huge anvil. <laughs> and so if you could remove those fairly shared anvils, you might be able to reduce the margin of error in your reading. And so that's kind of the idea. And it's not proven, but it's suspected that that might be a complicating factor. Gotcha. What about if he uses fresh Ipsum on each site too? So he's not using the same lorem Ipsum. Yeah, yeah. And that would get the uniqueness in the results if you're re-rolling the Ipsum for each test case. And uh, maybe don't use Latin, uh, you know, use uh, randomly generated uh, uh, letters. I, I wouldn't use alphanumeric because Google might say, oh, these aren't words. These are identifiers of some kind. Right. But random, randomly generated letters uh, would probably not trigger the translate this page, hopefully, or uh, use English Ipsum. But, uh, you know, people might argue that that could cause accidental sentiment. Um, so, you know, you, you'll have to try something different if you want to eliminate the translate this page issue, though. Yeah. yeah, and that showed up immediately for every site. Yeah, that's... That's effectively Google saying, we believe the context of this search is English, and these results have the incorrect language penalty. <laughs> um, so you, yeah, you wanna try to avoid that. Okay. Well, I'm gonna have more tests to run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> it, it's cool. I would, I would love to know if out of the box, you know, one of these solutions has, you know, better base SEO and for what reasons. So I think it's a totally worthwhile thing to test. Well, I think when you put them head to head, 
the way I did it, um, you know, out of the box, Joomla does have some more core SEO features um, available to it. So I think that's an advantage that Joomla has that WordPress doesn't have unless you add plugins, you know, and I'm trying to keep the plugin variable out of it because that just, you know, isn't, isn't fair. And it's, it's not a, not an even test to run. So I think, uh, I think when I look at, you know, this type of tests, I want to know, is Google going to favor one CMS over the other and then try to figure out why, you know, what is it, is it the code base, you know, is it, you know, the use of that CMS on the, on the internet, which I initially would have thought a hundred percent WordPress probably would have won this just because the massive amount of how many sites on the net use WordPress versus Joomla. And that's, that's the absolute only reason that I really thought that WordPress would have won. So I was really shocked at the outcome, you know, because it does seem in these tests, like Google is favoring the Joomla site for some reason. And it's really hard to know why. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to say, I don't care in the outcome. I just like to follow the data and, you know, you, you get all these pleasant surprises when you do. So I, I wouldn't be surprised that the underdog uh, might have advantages, you know, that that's a cool finding. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see more research in this area. I think it's cool. It could be, and this is just me spitballing, but because WordPress is so popular, when they see something like Joomla out of the norm, they're like, oh, this is awesome, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and there's some actual uh, support for that. Like I noticed, you know, way back when iPhones were new, that putting a uh, Apple Touch icon on your page gave you a bump, so I did it site-wide. And then, you know, three months later, it stopped giving that little boost. But it's like, you know, some something happened there. And I don't think a human being was saying an Apple Touch icon is is a factor. I, I think it, it was a, you know, a math anomaly in the system. And then when HTML5 came out, I saw something similar that for, you know, six weeks to three months, there was this boost if you add HTML5. And then it kind of died back down. And so my theory on that is that Google has a training set, you know, maybe for what is web spam. And the AI is, you know, calculating a spamminess score for your page compared to the training set. And so for a while, you know, anything that makes you different from the web spam training set probably gives you an incremental little boost. And it could be that there's an awful lot of WordPress in the web spam training set. And maybe Joomla just by being different gives you a little boost. That's a possibility. Interesting. Great food for thought. Mike, I appreciate you bringing this on. I know Kyle talked about it in the, the last SEO Fight Club, but just getting more detail on it was actually pretty good. So. Uh, I appreciate you volunteering the page and the test and looking forward to seeing what you do with it after implementing some of that stuff and see what happens. Yeah. You're, you're, a, rock star. Work. you're <laughs> a rock star in my book for doing testing <laughs> and sharing it. It's just awesome. Yeah. But just so you know, I'm not going to switch the Joomla. I don't care what you're testing. No, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not switching back either. <laughs> I can't remember. The last, I think it was like two, at least two years since I've seen a site that actually worked on that was in Jim. <laughs> so. uh, they're they're out there. There's a lot of them out there. So yeah. I think my grandparents made it. <laughs> All right. So that is uh, it for SEO this week. We already had an hour, so I want to be respectful of you guys' time. So we're not going to do any questions this week. I will say that I want a, to do an on-page video for everybody. I'll probably do it live if you are around and you want to come on. Uh, then that's great. But what I'm looking to do maybe today or tomorrow just depends on how kind of, how things go, uh, how I get through my task list for today, uh, is do a, a video on how I use P Page Optimizer Pro or POP and Core together uh, for on page optimization. Uh, if you're in the core Skype group, you know that Kyle and Ted have been beat up about that. Uh, 
constantly. And I think it'd probably be good to hear from a third party. I'm just a, just a user. This is how I do it. Maybe you can apply that um, because when you take it from the, from a, the perspective of the creators, uh, it kind of gets muddled in my opinion. So uh, I'm going to give my, my, uh, my thoughts on it, my, uh, how to apply it and how to use those two tools together uh, to get the best results. We're actually, I, I even drove, uh, got all the data for uh, the term. We're going to go after Yuma SEO. So if you want to go in there and look at it, uh, check it out. You see, I'm already ranking number five. At least that's where I was today. Uh, and that was just using Page Optimizer Pro. Uh, so I'll show you the starting point there uh, and where the new report is on POP. Uh, and then we'll look at Cora and how we're going to apply all that data and see if we can take over the number one position with just on page optimization. I've not built any links to it. Uh, I, I don't even have a, a GMB set up for it yet. Uh, so that's uh, what we're going to do with that. Ted, SEO Fight Club tomorrow. I have zero clue on what we're talking about. Literally, I have no clue. Um, do you? Or are you gonna I, I have a clue. It's <laughs> awesome. And I guess we got to spoil the topic on your show. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we are having Joe Priest, another SEO researcher, come and share his research. And he is looking at Google's new natural language APIs, and he found some data in those APIs that correlates with rankings in Google. Nice. And the implications of what he's found I think are fantastic. So I think it's, you know, my personal opinion, it's another case of the data suggesting that it's 2008 again. And there was way back in 2008, a very comparable integration into Google that was very public and made a lot of people angry, made a lot of people ha uh, happy. So, uh, but there was this integration and it was part of the Google ecosystem and then Google moved away from it. <laughs> and this is some data that Google actually didn't move away from it. They changed it and hit it. <laughs> and now we're seeing through these APIs that it may have still been there all along, but what they might've done was outsource some human jobs to AI. No, they won't. Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow we're going to talk about that research. And I can't wait. I think it's going to be a good show for us eggheads. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. All right. Oh, let's see. Let's see. I'm going to go through any questions here, real quick. Was that humor? She uh, No. And the rest of it was nothing much. But, okay, if you guys have questions for Mike, leave them in the comments. You'll check out on the comments in the YouTubes. Uh, or you can reach out to him. Mike, where can I reach out to you? Obviously, on your site. On my site, itdwebdesign.com. Cool. And Ted's got Cora. If you guys want to learn about Cora, check that out. And then my name is Clint Butler. I am the head of SEO or over the top SEO, over the top SEO.com. Or you can find me over at Digital Ear, depending on what you're looking for. And with that, thank you very much for joining us for SEO this week. I'll see you next week. See ya, right, guys.